Welcome to today's inspired talk on cultivating a growth mindset with Eduardo Braseño. My name is Seth Streeter and I'll be the moderator for today's exciting and most timely program. Please note this talk will be recorded and the playback link will be sent to all of registrants so you can share those with your friends and family. Please also put any questions that you have into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will leave plenty of time to answer your questions. That's always one of the best parts of the program. You can also use the chat box at the bottom of your screen for technical support and to respond to group questions. And at the end of the event, you'll be prompted to take a brief survey. We really value your feedback and ask you to please take the 60 seconds to complete it. Well, we are so fortunate to have with us a true expert on growth mindset, Eduardo Braseño. Today, we will learn what this is and why it is so important for us to cultivate no matter our age. Eduardo is a prolific keynote speaker on this subject. His multiple TEDx talks have nearly 5 million views. Eduardo was a co-founder and CEO of Mindset Works, with, which was a pioneer in the growth mindset development services that he started with Stanford professor Carol Dweck and he led for 13 years, and together they worked with over 100 corporate clients, including many major global brands, helping them to develop a growth mindset culture. Eduardo is a Pahara Aspen Fellow, a member of the Aspen Institute's Global Leadership Network, and an inductee into the Happiness Hall of Fame. I think we all would like to join that one. Originally from Caracas, Venezuela, Eduardo holds a bachelor's degrees in economics and engineering, from the University of Pennsylvania, as well as an MBA and a master's in education from Stanford University. And most importantly, he continues to enjoy lifelong learning every day. And with this, it is now my pleasure to welcome Eduardo Braseño to our Mission Wealth community. Welcome, Eduardo. Thank you so much, Seth. It's great to be here. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I look forward to our conversation today. So one thing I'm interested in is just how can we thrive in a complex, fast-changing, and ever-changing world, which we all know we live in, right? It's very apparent in the last two years in particular, but change will never stop. Change has never stopped. Even before humans existed, change has always going, been going on, and, and the pace of change has only accelerated because of humans, right? And so the question for me is, how can we become more adaptable to change? How can we thrive on change? How can we take advantage of change so that it brings more richness and joy to our lives? And how can we drive change in ourselves, in our communities, in our families, in our organizations? And that's what we're going to be exploring today. Uh, so our goal for this session is to advance our ability to adapt, grow, drive change, and thrive in a complex and ever-changing world. So we're going to do that by examining growth mindset, what it is and why it matters. We're also going to be looking to generate new insights about how growth happens and how can we become more effective at growth, both personal growth and community growth and organizational growth. And then throughout the session, identifying ways that we can take action. One of the ways that we're going to be interacting is through live polling, because when we reflect and when we share our thinking with each other, we learn more. And so I'm going to ask you to either take out your mobile devices or open up any browser in your computer in any device and navigate to this URL, paulev.com slash works, or scan this QR code if you want. Um, and, and just leave that browser up throughout our session because we're going to be using it throughout the session. But when you get there, you're going to see a poll that I want you to answer. The question is, how do I want my friends, family, and or colleagues to perceive me and to think of me. You can see the URL here at the top of this page as well. And I'll, I'll just display the QR code here for a second as well so you can navigate to it. So a strong, as trustworthy, inspiring, helping, helpful, kind, approachable, generous, well-rounded, reliable, happy, motivated, honest, leader, calm, compassionate, honest, fair, kind, most loving, awesome, impactful, successful, capable, loving, 
available. Great, we're gonna come back to this later in the session. I'm gonna ask you two more questions before we get into the content. The second question for me to get a sense of who we are here today and, and your background on this subject, how familiar am I with Carol Dweck's concept of growth mindset? Wow, so we have uh, about over half of, of the group that's never heard of it. That's very exciting to me because I'm very excited to introduce Growth Mindset to you because it's made a huge difference in my life and I'll share some of that with you today. And it's, it's, it's made a huge difference in the lives of millions of people. So I'm very excited to introduce Growth Mindset to you today. And all the way to about 10% of you are very familiar with it. And I'm very excited for you to be here too. You're, in, you're here obviously to learn more about it. And my goal is that we will all deepen our understanding of growth mindset and how to cultivate it and how to act upon it. But this gives me a sense of the room, right? Um, and finally, even if you've never heard of it, as, as more than half of you is the case, um, I want you to take a wild guess. In my own words, what does growth mindset mean? What might growth mindset mean? The ability to adapt, open to learning, lifelong learning, always trying to improve, being resilient, being positive, optimistic, always thinking about the future, resiliency, expansive, taking action to grow, embracing change, seeing failure as a strength, leading the way, being open-minded, being flexible, being adaptable, pushing yourself. Great. So a lot of these things are related to growth mindset. They're not exactly growth mindset. And that's great. That's why we're here is to get clear and deepen our understanding, right? Now, one, one reason that I asked this question is that anytime we're going to learn about something, it's helpful to quiz ourselves on our current understanding before diving into the topic. And the reason is that it enables us to see more nuance between our current understanding and the next level of clarity, right? And so when we ask people, what is growth mindset? We often hear some of the things that we just saw, right? Being open-minded, having a positive attitude, working hard, persevering. And a growth mindset is none of these things. So I want to be really clear about what we mean by growth mindset, what has been researched as growth mindset. Growth mindset is a perspective about the nature of human beings, okay? None of these things are a perspective about the nature of human beings. These are behaviors. Um, so specifically, growth mindset is when we believe that we can change and that other people can change. So when we see our abilities and our qualities as malleable, as changeable, as things that we can develop over time. And the reason that this is important is that this belief at the bottom it's necessary for the behaviors at the top to take place and to take place most effectively. And often what happens is that when we don't see the behaviors taking place, we try to change the behaviors directly, right? And what growth mindset research shows is that that's not very effective. It's a lot more effective to work at the belief and at the behavior level in parallel at the same time. And so a growth mindset, for example, is when we think that we can get smarter um, versus when we think that, that, that intelligence is something that's fixed in people, either a high or a medium or a low level, that's called a fixed mindset. Or when we think that some people are numbers people and others aren't, that's a, that's a fixed mindset about numbers and, and, and numeracy versus anybody can continue to become better at working with numbers would be a growth mindset, right? Or when we think that people are either natural leaders or not, that's a fixed mindset about leadership versus anybody can continue to develop as a leader and become a more effective leader. That's a growth mindset about leadership. So we can have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset or somewhere in between in any aspect of our work or our lives. Um, and so one reason that this is important is that if we want to improve, we have to change. Sometimes we like the idea of getting better, but we don't like the idea of change very much. And the reality is if we're the same today than we were last week or last month, we haven't gotten better. In fact, we've probably gotten a little bit less effective because the world has changed and we haven't. So the more that we understand that we can change, the more that improvement is possible. The other reason that this is important is that lots of research has shown how this belief affects our behaviors and then that affects our outcomes. And I'm going to unpack really briefly, summarize lots of research 
for you in a couple of minutes. And then we're going to reflect on when we tend to be in a fixed mindset and how that affects us. Because the reality is a fixed mindset is part of being human. We are all in a fixed mindset some of the time. And if we haven't identified that yet, we just haven't reflected long enough. And so we're going to take a little bit of time to reflect on that. But first, we're going to do the opposite. So imagine that a fixed mindset didn't exist, that we could change ourselves in any way we wanted to. If we take that as an assumption, if I could get better at anything, what would I improve? What would that be for you, whether personally or professionally? Public speaking. How I respond to negative events. Surfing. Not being so OCD. Being present. Anxiety, active listening, forgiveness, sleep, articulating thoughts or opinions. Sleep is one thing that I've oscillated between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset um, throughout my life. Now I'm more in a growth mindset at this moment, but it, it varies on whether I identify strategies that I can use to improve my sleep. So in strategies to improve and my mindset are very interrelated and we're going to be continuing to explore that. But what I want you to be thinking about here is think about what other people are writing and think about what you tend to see as fixed. Of these things, what do you tend to assume as you go in your everyday life that people either have or not have rather than things that people develop over time? Happiness, being present, organizational skills, surfing, managing overwhelm, my diligence, my self-worth, making friends. I had a very fixed mindset about making friends growing up, and that has changed a lot for me. Um, so, and that's the other thing about mindsets, right? We can change them, and we're going to be exploring that. Trusting myself, confidence, and self-love. Awesome. We're going to come back to that. So I want to share with you a couple of examples of people who tend to exemplify or model a growth mindset to get a little bit more concrete. So one example is Warren Buffett and his partner, Charlie Munger. They're some of the mo most effective investors of the 20th century. The question is, how do they see investing? Do they think that their genius is at it? They were born that way? Or is that something that they develop over time? Charlie Munger says, Warren Buffett has become a lot better as an investor since the day I met him, and so have I. If we had been frozen at any given stage with the knowledge we had, the record would have been much worse than it is. So the game is to keep learning. And Warren Buffett says, the key to success is going to bet a little smarter each day. That's how knowledge will builds up, like compound interest. J.K. Rowling, who wrote the Harry Potter book series, uh, I love that book series. They're incredibly creative. They opened up, to me, they opened up what's possible for a book uh, in terms of creating a different world. So what does she think about creativity and creative writing? She says, you have to resign yourself to wasting lots of trees before you write anything really good. That's just how it is. It's like learning an instrument. Oprah, one of the most successful media entrepreneurs of all time, she says, learn from every mistake because every experience, encounter, and particularly your mistakes are there to teach you. Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, he says, people who are right a lot, they listen a lot. And anybody who doesn't change their mind a lot is dramatically underestimating the complexity of the world we live in. What does the Dalai Lama say about the nature of happiness? He says, happiness is not something ready-made. It comes from your own actions. So what these people share is a belief that they can continue to get better at what they're really good at, right? Or what they have become really good at over time. And that affects their behaviors and their outcomes. And so I want to summarize what lots of research, like thousands of research studies uh, looking into this, have concluded. So when we're in a fixed mindset, we're thinking, okay, if people are either smart and talented or not, I want to be in the smart and talented category, right? And so the way I go about doing that is doing the things that I already know how to do really well, perfectly, quickly, without mistakes and without effort. I stay within my comfort zone versus in a growth mindset, we want to be challenged. We want to take on things that we can learn from, that we can become more capable from. And if we're doing things that are not challenging, sometimes we become bored and disengaged. In a fixed mindset, we view effort as something that is negative. Only people with low ability need to work hard. People with high ability don't need to work hard. So if we have to work hard at something, it makes us feel badly about ourselves. Versus in a growth mindset, we understand 
that effort is something that we can all benefit from, right? And the people who become the best at, in the world that whatever they do, they worked really hard to get there and continue to work really hard to get even better, like Olympic gold medalists, right? Um, when we experience setbacks like mistakes or failure in a fixed mindset, we take that evidence that our ability is fixed at a low level. So we say, I'm not good at this. Let me go try to find out what I am good at. So we give up and we, we go try to find something else. Versus in a growth mindset, we understand if we're doing something we haven't mastered yet, we are not going to do it flawlessly. So we're going to try different strategies. We're going to practice. We're going to ask for help. In a fixed mindset, when we receive feedback or criticism, we we tend to react defensively, right? We say, this person doesn't know what they're talking about or they're just trying to hurt me. Versus in a growth mindset, we listen and we ask ourselves, is there some truth here that I can learn from? And when other people succeed above us, in a fixed mindset, it makes us feel less capable. So we see them as a threat versus in a growth mindset, we observe them and we say, wow, you know, Seth is so good at this. What could I learn from him? What could I emulate? And all of these things enable us to learn and grow more over time and to achieve higher level of performance in work and in life when we're in a growth mindset. Now, there's research also that shows that a growth mindset not only makes us more effective learners, but it also impacts our relationships. And we can see how we view people who succeed at high levels, how that would impact our communication with them and therefore our relationship with them. Another example is when there's wrongdoing, like say somebody says something passive aggressive to us. In a, in a fixed mindset, we attribute the negative behavior to fixed traits in the other person. So we label them, right? And as a result of that, we tend to respond by retaliating, engaging in warfare, trying to beat them down versus in a growth mindset, we attribute the negative behavior to things that can change in the other person, like their current understanding, their situation, their motivation. And so we tend to respond by engaging in conversation, right? Sharing our perspective, listening to their perspective, being open to mutual influence. And finally, when life gets really hard, in a fixed mindset, we see higher rates of anxiety and depression and lower resilience. In a growth mindset, we see higher resilience and lower rates of anxiety and depression because we understand that we can change, the people around us can change. Whatever the challenge is, is not permanent. Now, this is a lot of information. You don't have to remember all of it. The key is that when we believe that we can change and other people can change, there's lots of benefits that come from that. It makes us more effective learners. We perform higher in work and in life. And it, it, it leads to more positive relationships with people around us. Now, one question that we often get asked is, can you have a growth mindset about one thing and a fixed mindset about another? And the answer is yes. So we might, for example, be in a growth mindset about using technology, believing that when a new gadget or technology comes out, we can learn how to use it and make the most of it. And at the same time, we might be in a fixed mindset about writing poetry, thinking that some people are just born poets and others aren't, right? Uh, and we can have both of these beliefs at the same time. And at the same time, we might go to a workshop, right? About poetry, where we learn some strategies to get better at writing poetry. And that can shift our mindset about poetry. Oh, wow, I could actually learn how to write poetry more effectively. And so we can develop more a growth mindset when we learn effective strategies to improve. So I want you to start thinking about what are some skills or abilities or qualities that you tend to see in a fixed mindset, whether in your work or in your life, and start continuing to become more aware of what those are without judgment, right? Without really uh, thinking that it's a bad thing. And we're gonna be thinking more about that. Also, our mindset about ourselves might be different than our mindset about others. So we might see ourselves as learners, for example, but as people who can improve, and we might label other people in fixed ways, whether people in our circle or in other circles. And so mindset is very specific about context, whether it's a skill or the place or the person that we're thinking about. Now, what I'm not saying is that we can change or improve anything we want. I'm not saying that. So as an example, I'm gonna give you an example of an ability that I would love to develop in myself, but I don't believe that I can. I believe I have a fixed mindset about it. I might be wrong or it might be right, but it is a fixed mindset that I have. And this is the ability to do this, right? I would love to be able to read two books at the same time because I love learning from books. Or, you know, I would love to even just be able to read a book 
while I listen to another audiobook, right? And just, I would be able to learn twice as much in, in the same amount of time, right? But I don't believe that I can do that. I believe when I, when I review the research, I just conclude that the brain can only do one conscious thing at a time. And so I can really focus on just one book at a time or one conversation at a time uh, versus a, a lot of times, you know, people are trying to do two things at the same time, being a conversation while trying to think about something else. And I believe that the brain can't do that. Right. And so that fixed mindset is helpful to me, I think, because um, it might be wrong, right? It might be like in 10, 20, 50 years, there might be, we might realize that the brain can do this and, and we just don't know the strategies yet. Um, but what, what I believe is that the brain can't do that. And I believe that's helpful to me because then if I want to become a more effective learner, I will try other strategies, not this one, but I will try other strategies that I believe I can develop uh, in order to achieve that higher level goal. So a fixed mindset is part of being human. We all experience a fixed mindset some of the time. And what we need to do is to become more acquainted of, of it, with it, more aware of it as a first step in the process of developing more of a growth mindset and of being able to shift our mindset, right? So that we can, we can observe our fixed mindset when it's present and then critically think about it and think about, is this serving me well or not? So let's take a moment to think about what is one ability I tend to see as fixed which may be limiting me or others. Let's share that with each other. Writing. Aging, cooking. We're going to be talking more about aging later, which I'm really excited to share with you. Um, time management, golf, running, career change, being a musician, ability to organize, procrastinating. I'm not as smart as the next person. I'm a bad cook. And, you know, as you can see, some people's fixed mindset are different than your fixed mindset. You're probably going to be seeing some things here that you believe people can develop, just notice that somebody else sees that same thing as something that is fixed in people. Similarly, what you see as fixed is something that other people see as, as things that can be developed. And so these mindsets vary by person. And often they're based on assumptions that most of the time when we're thinking about something as fixed, most of those fixed mindsets are actually not true. There's research that shows that we can develop those things. Um, so aging, cooking, friends, abundant motivation, Fear of going against the grain, leadership, balance, fitness, cooking. Great. We're going to come back to that. Okay, so what can we do? So, so we've talked about what a growth mindset is and why it matters, why it's important. And we've tried to start becoming more aware of our fixed mindsets. All of those things are really important. And if you haven't done a lot of this work before, I encourage you to continue just trying to become more aware of your fixed mindset for the next couple of weeks. And ideally, what we want to do is as we're going about our daily life, being able to notice in the moment, oh, I'm in a fixed mindset right now. I'm either thinking about myself as fixed or other people as fixed and just noticing that you are in that moment uh, so that later we can think about, is that serving me well or not? And is that true or not? But three other things that we can do is one, think about how we frame things for ourselves and for others. Meaning what is it that we do on a daily basis is part of what we're doing, working to change ourselves, right? Which is necessary in order to improve ourselves. Second, what systems and habits are we using to change and improve ourselves constantly? And we're, we're going to be exploring all of this more. And finally, modeling learning. So not just talking about the importance of these things, but actually showing it visibly through our actions. So we'll be exploring these things, but I want to share with you a second framework that helps us do these three things at the same time. So we're going to explore today two frameworks. One is growth mindset and fixed mindset, and the other one is what I'm going to share with you right now. And, um, and I'm actually also then going to share with you some other thoughts on aging as well. So for, for this, I'm, I'm going to take us outside of our context for a second and examine a group of people who are fantastic at what they do. And we're going to think about why are they so good at what they do, okay? And this group of people is Cirque du Soleil. They're fantastic at what they do. I love to watch them perform. They do these incredible acrobatic things. They do them beautifully and artistically. 
But what we often don't have top of mind is why are they so good? Because when I see them perform, I very seldom notice any mistakes. They seem to be flawless. And so how can I reconcile that I admire their excellence, right, so much, but yet I'm saying in a growth mindset, we want to be challenging ourselves, making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. And what we often don't have top of mind is that the reason Cirque du Soleil is so good at what they do is they spend a lot of time doing something different, very different than what we see them do on stage, right? When they're behind curtains at the, at the gym or at the studio, they are missing the ball a lot. They are missing the timing a lot because they're working on what they haven't mastered yet, right? And it is the time that they spend on the left on what we call the learning zone that enables them to excel on the right on what we call the performance zone, right? Uh, but we only see their performance zone. We only see their flawlessness. Same thing in sports right now, Wimbledon is happening, right? And so if, if you're in like a Wimbledon match and you're having trouble with a particular move, like, you know, Nadal yesterday was having trouble with his serve because he had a problem with his abdomen. Uh, he had to change. He, he had to avoid that move that he was having trouble with, right? So if, if you're, having a, you're, you're having trouble with your top spin serve, for example, in that match, you're going to say, I need, I need to try something else. I'm not going to do the top spin serve. I'm going to do something else. But after the match, you're going to go to your coach and say, coach, I have to work on my top spin serve, right? So that's a very different activity, a very different area of attention than what we do during the match. And it is what we do in the learning zone, working on what we don't know or what we haven't mastered yet, that enables us to excel in the performance zone. And what often happens at work and in life is that we get stuck in the performance zone, just all the time trying to do things as best as we can, trying to minimize mistakes, and that leads to stagnation. So the people who become fantastic at what they do, they alternate between these two zones, they integrate these two zones. And the key here is that in order to improve, you have to be deliberate about improvement. Sometimes we think that improvement happens from just working hard, right? But we don't realize that there's two different types of hard work, hard work to get things done versus hard work to get better. And those are very different. Uh, so in the learning zone, our goal is to improve versus getting things done. We're working on what we don't know or what we haven't mastered yet. So we have to expect to make mistakes versus in the performance zone. We're, we're trying to do what we already know. We're trying to minimize mistakes. And no matter which zone we make a mistake, we want to respond in a learning oriented way, right? What can I learn from this mistake? What can I do differently going forward? And a growth mindset helps us in both zones, the, the understanding that we can get better helps us in both of those zones. In the performance zone, we're not at that moment working to improve, but we understanding that we can improve helps us stay calm when we're not flawless, helps us notice what we can improve so that later in the learning zone, we can work on that. So often in work and life, we're so busy just getting things done, just in this case, moving the cart, right? That we don't stop and pause and think, how, but how can I work smarter? How can I get more done in the amount of time I have? And that that reflection is an example of a learning zone activity. So when I asked you earlier, if I could get better at anything, what would I improve? Whatever you wrote down, I want you to think about, do you regularly engage in the learning zone with respect to that? Because if you don't, then you're not going to get better at it by magic, right? And if, if you don't, and you're not getting better, you might take it as evidence that you can't improve. So you develop a fixed mindset, believing you can't improve, because you're not improving, but you don't realize, and this is just what happens to all of us so much, you don't realize that the reason we're not improving is that we're not effectively and regularly engaging in the learning zone, right? The effective strategies are critical in order to get better. So I'm gonna share with you now, bringing it to our context, a few sample learning zone activities. And I want you to think about, is there one or two of these that I wanna be doing more regularly or better? I'll give you a moment to think about that. Is there one or the, two of these that I would wanna be doing more regularly or better? We'll also distribute a recording of this later, by the way. Great. So question, to what extent do I engage in the learning zone? What is true for you?
So we see a, um, a bit under 10% of you feel you're effectively engaging in learning zone to a great extent with by yourself and others. That's wonderful. And over 90% of you are in the middle two columns, which is wonderful as well. That's a very kind of growth-minded view, right? That we can always get better. And I'm excited that we're identifying something we can do, a way we can take action, right? Engaging in the learning zone more. Now, I want you to also notice that the last option, it looks like nobody so far has selected that. I don't think engaging in the learning zone would be useful for me. And so what I'm what I'm noticing from that, and, and it's something that I notice very frequently every time I do this, is this resonates, right? People like the learning zone. They want to, be, whether you're already doing it or want to do more of it, learning zone is a positive aspect of our lives. And I and, and this is important to notice because it means that you can do it with other people, right? Whether it's your friends, your family, your colleagues, if you introduce these concepts to them, uh, it's, they're going to resonate with them. And so you can engage in learning together through soliciting feedback, through exploring things together. And it's, it's more powerful to learn with others than by ourselves because more brains are smarter than one brain. They can notice things from different ways, uh, from different perspectives. We can have different backgrounds and different knowledge. And so I encourage you to engage people in your lives in this. And right now you all self-selected to be here. So that shows that you are interested in learning. But when I, most of the work I do is I go into companies and I do keynotes to all their staff or all the leaders. And these are the same results that I, that I find with them when they don't self-select, right? Uh, so this is something that resonates. I encourage you to engage in the learning zone with people in your life. Um, so now in order to engage in the learning zone, we have to work on what we don't know yet. That means we have to expect to make mistakes. That means that we need to be in a low stakes situation, right? Meaning that the consequence of mistakes must not be very material. So as an analogy, a Cirque du Soleil tightrope walker is not going to try new skills without a net underneath because they're going to fall and they're going to get hurt, right? And often the way we feel in our lives and in our work it's more like this, right? If we make a mistake, then there's gonna be negative consequences. Often the negative consequence is we think that other people will think less of us, right? That if we make mistakes, other, we're, other people are going to, to think less of us. And we don't want that. We, we care about what other people think of us. And so we need to think about what, what do we want in our communities? What do we want in our families? What do we want in our organizations? Do we want people to minimize mistakes all the time or we want people to take challenges and experiment and explore and evolve, right? And so some ways to think about this, and I, I also want you to think about, is it possible that other people see you as a shark, right? As somebody who will think less of them if they make mistakes, right? Uh, and maybe it's because of something you're doing unintentionally, but maybe it's because of, not because of anything you're doing, maybe it's just because of the ideas they have in their mind. But the question is, are you doing enough to create a sense of safety for them and for you to take on challenges and to try things that you don't know how to do yet? So some ways to think about that is creating safety islands. What are the times and spaces where you want to be working on the next level of challenge and then things that are new to you, right? Where, where it is safe to do that, right? And if there are times when it's not safe to do that, what are those times where you wanna be in the performance zone? Creating that separation, that distinction. And also we can think about creating safe waters in the sense that when we do make a mistake or when others make a mistake, we want them to feel safe to talk about it because we're all human. We make mistakes in the learning zone, but also in the performance zone. So can we talk about it to figure out, hey, what didn't go well? What can we do differently going forward? And three ways to create the sense of safety is first think about how you frame things for yourself and others using ideas like growth mindset, like learning zone, like performance zone. Second, what systems and habits are you engaging on in your life in order to always continue to improve? So a very simple one that I think is most powerful is every morning, I like to remind myself, I do, a, I do several things every single morning. And one of them is remind myself of what I'm working to improve, right? And so that, that assures that I'm always working to improve at something and that I'm reminding myself of it because improvement takes effort. And changing our brain takes effort and changing habits takes effort. And third, are we modeling learning visibly to others? Because our actions are really important. If we're saying that learning is important, but other people are not seeing that in us, our actions are going to speak louder than our words, right? Our actions communicate whether we believe people can improve, whether that's important and how we go about doing that. So we need to make that visible. 
So when I asked you earlier, how do I want my friends, family, or colleagues to perceive me and think of me? You wrote wonderful things like being reliable, well-rounded, friendly, motivated, trustworthy, loving and kind, helpful, thought leader, assisting. Those are wonderful things. I don't want to remove those things. I just want you to notice that you didn't write. I want them to see me as a learner. There you go. I'm a lifelong learner, right? As somebody who's a work in progress, someone who's always continuing to evolve. Because when we see each other that way, then we encourage one another to be lifelong learners and to continue to evolve throughout our lives, right? Um, so think about to what extent do you do these things? Are there one or two things that you could do more regularly or better to better model being a learner? I'll give you a moment to think about that. So I want to point you to a couple of resources that you can use to learn more about these topics or share these ideas with others. If you want to learn more about the learning zone and the performance zone or share that with others, I did a TED talk on it. It's 11 minutes. It's called How to Get Better at the Things You Care About. If you want to learn more about growth mindset, a great resource is the book Mindset by Carol Dweck. She's a Stanford professor. She's my mentor. This is a seminal book on mindset. And this book is about growth mindset. What we've been talking about is the belief that we can change. And this belief, this mindset is one of many, many mindsets, right? It's a very powerful one, but there's lots of other mindsets too. Mindsets are beliefs that affect our behaviors and our outcomes. And so there's lots of different mindsets. And I want to talk about one other mindset that's really important, and that's our beliefs about age or about aging. Uh, so there's, there's lots of research that has shown that people tend to see aging in one of two different ways or somewhere in between, either aging as debilitating or aging as thriving. So in, when, when we're thinking of aging as debilitating, we associate aging with slowness, with irrelevance, with disease, with dependence, close-mindedness, being stubborn, right? Being a drain on others versus the belief that anybody can thrive at any age, right? And, and that age comes with knowledge and wisdom, with competence, with resources, with health, independence, curiosity, contribution to others. And so people have these beliefs. And in Western societies, like in the United States, we tend to associate aging with debilitation, right? With, with something of irrelevance and slowness. And, and so our beliefs, our mindsets, are things that we acquire from the world around us, from other people around us, from the media. Um, and so in Western societies, there's a lot of kind of beliefs implicit in the groundwater, right? In everything we see and hear, uh, like, you know, in our language too, like, um, for example, you know, being young at heart, what does that mean? What does being young at heart mean? And whatever those things mean, why is it that older people have less of that? That's just an assumption that then turns into reality because that's the mindset in the culture, right? So when we see aging as thriving, research shows that people who see aging as thriving have greater health. Uh, they have greater ability physically and mentally. They do more creative work. Um, they, um, they have a greater quality of life, greater health greater independence, better relationships, and even more longevity by seven and a half years. If you want to learn more about this, which I think is, this is, I think this is really, really important information for anybody to know. Uh, I recommend this book, Breaking the Age Code by Becca Levy. She's the world expert on it. This is a new book that just came out and, and it's a wonderful book to, that helps us reflect about our beliefs about aging and how can we develop more more adaptive, more positive, helpful beliefs about aging and associations for ourselves and for others. So before we turn it to QA, and I'm just gonna do a quick, quick key takeaways for us to think about what is it that is most important that I'm drawing from this time together. And to do that, I'm just going to ask you to generate that. So one more poll question, what was the most valuable insight or takeaway for me from what we've explored so far today? When we identify and write down what our insights are, we're more likely to reinforce those new neural connections and turn them into long-term memory. Awareness of when I have a fixed mindset, that increased awareness is precious. I'm glad that you're taking that. 
There's more than one mindset. There's the learning zone. We can get better with aging. Safety islands. Book recommendation, breaking the age code. Focus on learning from my mistakes. Learning from mistakes is critical, especially from our mid-20s on. That's the main way that we can be proactive about learning and growth, is learning from our mistakes. When the brain makes a prediction and then that prediction turns out not to be true, that's when neuroplasticity gets triggered. Mistakes are opportunities. Learning zone activities take time. Absolutely, learning and improvement takes time. It's a gradual thing that takes time. Progress, not perfection. Yeah, perfection, the idea of perfection is a fixed mindset idea because if we are perfect, it means we can't further improve. That's a fixed mindset. Importance of the learning zone. Awesome. So let's open it up to a QA. and uh, a Seth, why don't you join me? I look forward to our conversation. Everybody, you know, submit any questions. This is wonderful, Eduardo. Uh, I know we're all inspired and uh, we have a number of questions that have been submitted to me. So let me just kind of kick in with some and please put your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We would love to get to the, your questions. Okay, here's the first. Uh, I'm still early in my career. How do I use a growth mindset instead of a fixed mindset to help me grow? Great. Uh, so uh, yeah, growth mindset and a fixed mindset can help anybody. It can, it actually, mindset start, uh, there's research shows mindsets, mindsets start around when we're one to three years old and we, they can always change throughout life. Um, so early in our career or later in our career, I think be starting by being mindful about what we're seeking to improve. So what are you trying to proactively get better at, right? And, and then how are you going to get better at that? What are the learning zone strategies that are going to be helpful for you? I think in the workplace in particular, the most effective learning zone strategy, in my opinion, is soliciting feedback regularly and broadly. So, you know, very, very frequently just soliciting feedback from your colleagues, from your clients, from people who interact with you so that you can learn what's in their mind. We can't know what's in other people's minds. And often we make assumptions that we know, right? We, we, what we think that somebody's thinking X or Y or Z or feeling X or Y or Z, and we are pretty sure of ourselves. And what I've learned is that I'm, when I make assumptions like that, I'm almost always wrong. You know, if I, if I get the opportunity to learn what's in their mind and how I'm coming across, what's helpful, what's not helpful that I'm doing, for example, um, I learned so much from that. So that, you know, and it early, I think early in our career, in particular, putting ourselves in situations where we can learn a lot. So from, you know, working with people who know a lot and who can teach us a lot is, uh, is something that I think is, is a wise way to go. Wonderful. We've received some questions on failures and how to bounce back after failures. One is my last startup business failed after three years. I'm trying to think about my next moves in life. How do I incorporate a growth mindset after a failure like this? Yeah, so failures are, uh, I mean, in I live in Silicon Valley and here failures are kind of a batch of honor. They're, they're, they're not something that people look down upon uh, because you can learn a lot from failures. Um, and as I said, so neuroscience research shows that when we are really young, before our mid-20s, we there's neuroplasticity that is triggered from our experiences, just from living and just observing things or hearing language. Our brain changes just from that. From our mid-20s on, that neuroplasticity happens a little bit differently. And what actually triggers neuroplasticity in the brain is mistakes is when the brain makes a prediction and that prediction turns out not to be true. Uh, that's when um, what triggers neuroplasticity. And I know Seth knows Andrew Huberman, who's a neuroscientist at, at Stanford and episode seven of his podcast is a fantastic episode on how learning happens. And he talks about that uh, in terms of the science of the brain. And so learning from failure, learning from mistakes is critical. Is, is a key, like Oprah said, it's a key way to learn. I think if possible, we want to have failures a lot more often and less impactful, right? So we want to be ex do experimenting all the time and creating lots of failures, of little failures all the time so we can learn from them rather than creating a gigantic failure every 10 years that's less helpful than lots of failures all the time. But we had a failure, we tried something, you know, just reflecting on that, what we can learn from that 
and think about what, what do I want to do next, right? And whether, whether our last venture failed or succeeded, I think the answer to me is the same. It's like, what do I want to try next? What, what am I passionate about? What, how am I trying to make the world a better place? And trying that next thing. Uh, and, and hopefully not something that I already know how to do because that's a lot less interesting and fulfilling than something that's new and that will help me grow. Wonderful. Okay, we have a bunch of questions. So we're going to go into speed rounds here. But this one is uh, not an easy one. What do you think is the first step in discussing with family members who may be stuck in fixed mindsets? Yeah, it's not an easy. I agree, Seth. Uh, this is something that people, we, we tend to gravitate toward when we learn about growth mindset and fixed mindset. It's like, oh my gosh, like there's something I hear very often. It's like, I'm having a big insight. My spouse has a fixed mindset. What do I do? <laughs> or, you know, my boss or somebody that reports to me. And, and that's fine. That's fine to become aware of that but it is really helpful to start with ourselves and to like so i encourage you to reflect on when am i in a fixed mindset and how can i work on that but to to answer your question it depends on our relationship with them it depends on our how much trust they have in us it, it really depends on how aligned we are in our goals so how do we influence somebody else i think it's a it's a huge topic that we can learn so much about and we can start by asking ourselves do, do I, am I in a fixed mindset or in a growth mindset about my ability to influence somebody else? And if, if I believe that I can get better at influence, then there's lots of books and videos and experiments that we can do in terms of how we can better influence somebody. But something we can pretty much always do is plant seeds, right? Sometimes we try to change other people and that doesn't tend to work, but we can always plant seeds, right? Like just little comments and, and show through our behavior and over time, those little changes at some point create a big change. Uh, it's kind of like the, the book, The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, a lot of little things that you plant and all of a sudden the thing tips. And like they have a huge insight that's, that's informed by all their prior experiences, including the seeds you planted. But um, so I would say framing, how do we explain what we value using ideas like growth mindset, learning zone, performance zone, systems and habits, just developing those are those habits of how to learn and improve. Like for example, soliciting feedback and modeling learning. And uh, that's how we influence other people is by growing on ourselves and making it visible so that we, they can see what we're, what we're gaining from our own growth. And then eventually they can follow the way. Yeah. I just started taking a ceramics class to learn how to throw pottery on the wheel and there was someone in the class that initially I had some judgment around because of just their way of being. And now I have such a great appreciation for him because he's such a gifted uh, ceramicist. He throws amazing pottery on the wheel. So I think maybe part of having a growth mindset is learning to let go of some of those initial judgments and focusing on the appreciations because all people have certain gifts. And so maybe we might judge them as having a fixed mindset in some areas, but if we instead scan for their gifts and how we can appreciate them and their gifts, maybe that'll help them grow and help our perception of them grow. Thank you, Seth. I agree completely. And, and that appreciation creates trust. It, they feel seen. They feel like you're, you're not attacking them. So it, it opens them more to, to hearing different things. And I think you, you said something that, that, that triggers something for me in a positive way, which is that I like to remind myself that I can never be 100% sure of something. You know, it, it, the moment I think I'm 100% sure of something um, is the moment that I stop listening, I stop uh, considering other experiences. And so when I'm more curious and I try to observe other people and ask questions, and I can see more of those things that you talk about that I can appreciate. Mm -hmm. How do we identify when we may be in a fixed mindset? How does the body feel or how can we catch ourselves when we're in a fixed mindset? Any tips there? Yeah, so if you if you think about the behaviors that are associated with a fixed mindset, that can be a clue, right? So if if I am reacting defensively to feedback or if I'm not like shying away from challenge rather than wanting to challenge, um, if we are if I'm seeing effort as something that's negative that's making me feel less capable, then we can think about why am I feeling this? Is there an underlying assumption here that I can't get better? Um, and, and, but, but often a fixed mindset can create anxiety. It can, when we're comparing ourselves to other people, that can be a, a clue too, because often when we're comparing ourselves to other people, we often forget 
the process. We forget because we haven't seen, you know, if I see a fantastic athlete doing something amazingly or Cirque du Soleil, I'm not seeing the process that they went through to, to get that better or a great person in terms of a leader or, or a public speaker. And so remembering the process, right? But, but when we are comparing ourselves, that often puts it in a fixed mindset. So that can be another clue that we might be in a fixed mindset. But looking for those clues, looking for those emotions of anxiety and then reflecting is, is an assumption about people not able to change behind those symptoms. Got it. Speaking of comparing ourselves to others, how has social media impacted the adoption of a growth mindset? Is it good being inspired by others and their videos, or should we just simply focus on our own internal learning efforts? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, my, I would hypothesize, I haven't seen research on this, that social media probably has heightened the kind of the comparison factor. You know, like we, people tend to show in social media the things that are make them going to make them look good and they're going to make their life look so interesting. And, and so we see all this amazing thing in other people and we don't see their struggles as much. We don't see their process as much. So that can put us, I think, more in a fixed mindset. I think the other thing that social media does that, that impacts our effectiveness in, in work and in life a lot is just, it creates a lot of distraction. It creates a lot of notifications. It, 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 it attacks our ability to be mindful and to generate a state of flow and focus. And, and both mindfulness and flow are really, really important to effectiveness. Um, and so I think that with social media, we, 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 we need to develop habits in our lives to really be able to put that away, right? Put the phone away, put it on silent and spend you know an hour, two hours doing one thing. Um, and that is a big challenge uh, for, for the social media has brought to our lives. Yeah. If you could speak just a minute about transitions, whether it's someone moving into an empty nest phase with their kid launching or maybe moving into retirement, um, how can we successfully use transitions to adopt a growth mindset? Any tips there? Yeah. So when researchers have studied growth mindset, the most effective we can develop a growth mindset at any time in our lives, but the most effective way, like time to insert a growth mindset intervention is at times of transition. So it could be when people are starting, when kids are starting a new grade or a new school, or when we're starting a new job or a new role or a new team, or when we're becoming parents, um, any time of transition is a really important time where our mindset becomes more malleable and more in a way vulnerable, both for good and for bad, right? Because if we're, if we're, if we're retiring, for example, right, we're starting a new stage in our life, we're going to need to change in some way. So we're going to need to think about who do I need to be in this next chapter of my life? What beliefs are going to serve me well? What habits are going to serve me well? And so we can leverage those times of transition in order to to develop those new skills, right? There's also, it doesn't also have to be a life transition. We can also create our own moments of transition. It could be, you know, New Year's or a new month or a month or just, just a random Monday, or it can be this webinar right here. This is the webinar where I started doing X every day. Um, and so those moments that are, that are milestone moments we can create and, and they can be opportunities for us to affect a lot of change, a step, step function change in ourselves. Yes. And, and I think celebrating ourselves as even if we quote unquote fail, celebrating that we put ourselves out there. We tried to go surfing. We tried a new art class. Okay. We have time for two more questions, Eduardo. Uh, first one is how does playfulness become a tool for cultivating a growth mindset? Talk about playfulness versus seriousness in growth yeah. mindset. Playfulness is wonderful. You know, when uh, a, a state of positive emotions is more conducive to learning and growth, uh, let alone you know happiness and effectiveness. Um, so, so playfulness also involves trying new things and and you know being being having joy from kind of failure and from experimentation and from trying silly things too. Like when when we are, for example, when we're brainstorming. Uh, if we're more playful, if we're we're sharing ideas that are more wild and more ideas that will never work, 
they can get us to better ideas because those ideas can trigger things that we wouldn't have thought about otherwise. So when we're playful, we're ex exploring things that are more distant, which leads to innovation. Uh, we're in more positive emotions and all those things help us learn and experiment and find new ways of living and of working. Thank you. We have some people that are asking questions about, can a growth mindset be toxic? Or if I'm trying to cultivate joy rather than working harder and smarter, uh, is there a way to have growth mindset without the pressure to have to work harder to do more, to like have ease? And, or, you know, I guess the question is, around, is there toxicity to too much application of growth mindset? Can it be something that can be embraced with ease and flow, like you said? I do think growth mindset can be embraced with ease and flow. And one way I think about this is uh, you can think we all have what's called a hierarchy of goals. So, for example, you one of your goals might be to succeed in your job or in your organization right and so if you think about how how do i get better in my job or in my profession you might come up with answers like well work harder work longer hours right and and what we're missing there is that what what is the goal of succeeding in my job or in my organization? What is the higher level goal? Why do I care about that, right? So if we if we ask why, we get to higher level goals. We ask why several times. For me, once when I when I when I ask why several times, my highest level goal is happiness, fulfillment, and appreciation. That's why I do everything in my life. And so when I think about how can I get better at that, how can I get better at happiness, fulfillment, and appreciation? Well, it's not but for working, you know, 10 hours a day and just doing one thing. Like I need to be playful and I need to like enjoy and, and have fun uh, and, and, and develop deeper relationships and have health. Uh, so, so it's reminding ourselves. And, and actually, I, I have a diagram. It's a one page diagram that, that has what I care about in my life and at the center of it is happiness, fulfillment, and appreciation. And so then when I ask, how do I want to pursue that? I have several things around it, like you know, being of service to other people, et cetera. Um, and so by, by remembering what are the most things that are most important to us, and a growth mindset about those things, that's what's most important. Like, how can I get better at the things that I care most about? I think that a growth mindset is always helpful in that sense. Yes, that's so inspiring. Well, Eduardo, though, thank you so much. We have more questions coming in. We'll have to have you come back sometime. Uh, again, we will share with everyone uh, a copy of the link to this program. And I know that we're all already currently thinking about ways that we can grow in new ways. So thank you so much. Uh, we're excited to be able to uh, be able to give you all links. You can share this with your friends and family. We'll also be creating a blog summarizing some of these top takeaways. And we would love to have you please fill out the survey that you'll be getting momentarily. Uh, this survey will just take you about 60 seconds, and we'd love to get your ideas for future Inspired Talk subjects and speakers. So if today sparks some new ideas that you may want to put into action, please share these with your Mission Wealth Advisor so we can help make them a reality. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you again, Eduardo, and here's to having an amazing day filled with growth and learning. Thank you, Seth. Bye-bye.